much for uh, coming again. Uh, I'm Eleni Vasté, I'm the director of the International Studies Institute. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to have um, uh, such a distinguished speaker today with us, both uh, this morning, uh, his lecture on ISIS in Syria that you will hear, but also at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he will give a lecture on uh, women and minorities in Turkey in James Hall. So you are invited to both uh, and uh, But uh, before um, we um, go to the lecture, I would like to thank the groups uh, that uh, rose to the occasion and uh, made this um, visit possible. And uh, that is the Colorado European Union Center for Excellence and the European Union Commission from the University of um, Denver are um, one of the sponsors, as well as the National Security Studies Program here at UNM. And I want to thank Frankie Feather for his support. Um, and uh, last but not least, the uh, American <coughs> Students Association and uh, their valiant leader, Sabat in um, Kurt here, who um, is a PhD student at UNM and uh, who made it possible in a very short time to get funding from ASUNM. And uh, I thank him, I thank the advisor, uh, my colleague, and um, the students who um, joined in to welcome them. And I would also like to welcome um, Sinan's mother. She did it. And uh, we are very happy to have her all the way from Istanbul, she's an artist herself. And um, delighted to meet um, the student community here. Now it is also a pleasure to introduce um, our colleague Amina Tawassel, Dr. Tawassel, who is the uh, lecturer at uh, the International Studies Institute, who will be introducing our speaker, Mr. Sinan Jidi. Dr. Sinan Chidi. He is an expert on Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy. He, he obtained his PhD from School of Oriental and African <coughs> Studies, University of London in 2007 in the field of political science. He serves as the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies. Um, his book titled Kemalism in Turkish Politics, the Republican People's Party um, secularism and nationalism focuses on the electoral weaknesses of the Republican People's Party. Between 2008 and 2011, he established the Turkish Studies Program at the University of Florida Center for European Studies. So today's topic is going to be about um, Turkey, ISIS, and Syria. Turkey has long been considered a critical ally in the ongoing fight against the forces of ISIS in the United States. That being said, Turkey's government has been reluctant to take an active and engaged posture up until very recently, after direct ISIS attacks on Turkish soil. It has even been suggested that Turkey provided logistical support and assistance to the terrorist organization, leading some analysts in Washington and beyond to question Turkey's affinity towards an even continued membership um, in NATO. What are the salient factors that undermine Turkey's position towards ISIS? Do Turkey and the United States have a joint plan on how to defeat ISIS? And what is the likely role that Turkey will play in the future stability of the Middle East? Without taking much longer, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Chief. Thank you very much, um, especially to all the sponsors, but uh, my hopefully friend and colleague now, uh, Dr. Eleni Bastia, who spearheaded uh, this invitation and worked tirelessly behind the scenes. It's, if you ever get to um, you know, have to invite somebody to a university campus, it's a lot of work. Um, so I do appreciate all that, uh, the time and effort that you've taken to make this possible. With that ado, um, if there's anyone in the, in the audience who is friendly with the um, police force here, I did get a speeding ticket recently, so um, if anybody knows how to waive that, um, <laughs> if you have any connections, that would be wonderful. I'd rather not pay that. Um, but, you know, other than that, that's, I, I also got one recently in, in Virginia, so 
I don't think I have an issue of speeding, but I, apparently I keep on missing 45 mile per hour zones. Um, and whether it's just karma or something else, I'm not sure. Um, but it's certainly nice to be out of the Washington DC area um, and in the desert for the first time in a long time. The last time was in Arizona, um, but here is quite different. Um, and it's a distinct pleasure to be able to address um, a lot of you here. So thank you for making the time um, and, and taking an interest in this. Uh, what I have to say, I, unfortunately, is not necessarily a rosy uh, picked, uh, t uh, typ uh, typification um, of an analysis of what the future holds for the region or the area. Although the title is specifically targeted on looking at the Islamic State and its, and its future spread and its containment, um, what I'm about to present is a very sort of regional perspective. And I think this hopefully might go to, for those of you who are interested in this, really to the crux of the problem of what we are hoping to deal with as a country here, as a national security establishment here, um, but further afield also with the United States' as international allies and partners, but also um, regional entities such as the European Union in really nailing down the problem. And my essential argument that I would hopefully try and present to you is to state that the longer that there is continued inaction on the part of great powers such as the United States and its partners, not by itself, but the United States and its partners, the longer that that is allowed to precipitate and continue, the more this problem will become protracted and entrenched from the perspective of regional disputes, from the perspective of individual countries, national and particularistic interests, namely that of Turkey for on the one level, but by no means limited to Turkey but countries such as the Russian Federation, such as Iran, and also such as uh, other entities such as the Saudi Arabians and the Qatari Gulf states. Um, so, um, like I said, it's very much of a regional perspective, but if we were to look at the, the map overall in terms of the Islamic State, what it means for the region, I think the best way that we sort of can typify this is to say that this is possibly the single largest threat to international peace and security that we have known probably since the end of World War II now. Um, and that's a bold claim, I think, and some analysts might disagree with that. But certainly from the perspective of regional analysts that are looking into this, um, the single largest threat to basically challenge collective international peace and security mainly because not of the military might and prowess of the Islamic State, but the pull factor that it presents to possible conflictual relations that might emanate from that in the very near future. Um, how, can we, how can we sort of characterize this? Well, first of all, from the perspective of humanitarian perspective. I mean, this is the one, unfortunately, that power play, you know, real, the realist paradigm of international relations or you know, great power struggles between uh, powers such as the United States and Russia care least about. Uh, this is the largest displacement and migratory flow of refugees that we have seen certainly since World War II. Um, Turkey alone is home to right now approximately three million refugees. And I was saying to my colleagues earlier on, three million people inside, of a, inside one's country is no longer a refugee problem, but it's a minority issue. Turkey has a population of 75 million, and no other country is hosting 3 million people within its borders who are, in, who are externally displaced uh, from their homeland. It is estimated up to 50% of Syria's population is now either uh, refugees or internally displaced. Um, and to, a, to the extent that it has been internationalized on CNN here, or the BBC World Service, or other news outlets, um, you're also looking at the second biggest intaker of refugees in Syria, out, out of Syria in places like Jordan, which approximately home to about a million refugees. And if the Jordanians, if you thought that's the first uh, uh, refugees that they've taken in, they've been hosting Palestinian refugees for the better part of 30 years, or if not more. So the smaller part of this, but one which has been internationalized more, is the amount of refugees that the European Union is considering taking in. And I say that in the most polite, uh, uh, politest of terms. Uh, polite as in, sen as in saying 
that the European Union, in my opinion, and not just my opinion, has been catastrophically woeful in handling or accommodating uh, the biggest humanitarian challenge uh, that's been presented to the shores of the most economically prosperous bloc in the entire world. Uh, and there seems to be a scramble as to what to do with thousands of people knocking on European countries' doors. And it seems to be the country uh, which uh, drives away the most uh, refugees knocking on the door seems to be um, winning the day in terms of its uh, domestic pub pub uh, public opinion, whether it's Germany, whether it's the UK or France. Uh, so that's just a humanitarian perspective. Millions of people that have been displaced and unsettled. The second and the most, the problem that everybody else cares about in Syria is the Islamic State and what kind of problems it presents. For domestic political opinion, that, that we consume, whether we watch CNN, Fox News, whatever you uh, are subjected to. Um, I think the biggest question that we're asking ourselves is, what can we do to prevent a bomb that's gone off, uh, a similar type of bomb that's gone off in Paris, Brussels, Istanbul, uh, Lahore, wherever else you want to call it, right? What are we going to do to make sure that similar type of explosions don't happen here? And essentially, that's what... Um, the news analysts and news anchors are asking ourselves, as opposed to policymakers in Washington who are asking the larger questions of, well, what are we going to do to ensure that the biggest threat uh, that's challenging the territorial integrity and energy security and the territorial uh, borders of Syria and Iraq what are we going to do, or what should we be doing as a country here with our partners and allies to prevent these entities from falling apart or actually containing the terrorism threat that seems to be engulfing the entire region since about 2011, 2012? And right now, we don't have an answer to that. And that's the biggest worry. Whether you're looking at it from a very individualistic perspective and thinking, well, are we going to see bombs going off in any way that I know? Or whether it's the analysts and policymakers who are thinking, well, are we going to be able to contain and in basically guarantee the territorial structures of the Syrian state? And possibly, in addition to that, to the Iraqi state, are we going to be able to contain it there such that we don't have an implosion of two territorial states in the Middle East which will then throw the entire region into further turmoil. And the reason we don't have a strategy is because we don't actually have anything beyond a containment policy. Right now, if you ask anybody what's going on, what is the United States and its partners or the Western Alliance doing to contain the Islamic State, the answer is twofold. One is aerial bombardment campaigns against Islamic State uh, targets in northern Syria. And two, we are providing logistical training support to uh, basically entities that have been labeled as moderate rebels, uh, mainly the Kurdish uh, YPG fighting forces, Kurdish fighting forces that are the only basic foot soldiers combating the Islamic State elements within northern Syria itself. So that's the essential uh, policy that we have been following, and that's mainly been spearheaded by the United States. Uh, there are French fighter aircraft to a certain extent, uh, uh, as well as possible British elements uh, that is helping in, uh, in these aerial bombardment campaigns. But the, you know, the, 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 the legwork on the ground has been done by Kurdish fighters, and the aerial bombardment has been carried out by US forces uh, from, from air bases taking off uh, predominantly in Turkey. And this is where Turkey has been a game changer, right? If you ask, uh, you know, what is the role that Turkey plays in basically being able to fight or take the fight against Islamic State, and if it's an indispensable ally, the question from the US perspective is yes, Turkey is quintessentially the possibly the biggest ally on the ground or in the region that will help defeat the Islamic State forces. Why? Geographic proximity. Until Turkey opened up its air bases to American fighter aircraft with the specific intention of bombing IIS targets, uh, these bombardment campaigns had to be carried out from US uh, aircraft carriers in the Persian, stationed in the Persian Gulf and fighter aircraft taking off from air bases 
in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. The problem with those locations is by the time that US fighter aircraft took off from these locations and carried out their bombing raids on Islamic State targets in northern Syria and went back, you're talking in thousands of miles distance. It's a fuel problem. Fighter aircraft that now take off from Turkey, it's less than 100 miles across the Turkish border into Islamic State. What now is happening is a 24-hour non-stop bombardment cycle against Islamic State uh, targets. And what that has allowed is basically right now the containment and further advancement of IS targets and has emboldened Kurdish fighters on the ground to basically uh, push back and hold back um, Islamic State progress, and in some cases, recapture some towns and cities. But is that going to be enough? Is that going to see the overall defeat of the Islamic State? And the answer to it is, if you listen to any military, and, uh, uh, military strategists in Washington or analysts uh, in think tanks and whatnot in my part of the world, the answer to that is likely to be no. Uh, bombing works to a certain extent, but it doesn't get rid of the actual insurgency. It doesn't actually get rid of the Islamic State presence overall. There is a real ground presence, which somehow uh, will, will likely um, continue to exist. And prior to the Islamic State, it was the prevalence and spreading of other non-violent, non sorry, non-state violent actors, such as Al-Qaeda, which has allowed to basically since uh, the security of the Iraqi state being able to uh, continue to flourish and transform into what is now known as the Islamic State. So more concerted effort in the longer term will be necessary to basically contain and eradicate the Islamic State. Unless we do, you're going to see the morphing of the Islamic State into likely other cultish names that we have yet to hear about. And the reason I say that is up until recently, or up until 2012, we have been basically reluctant to get involved to remove the Islamic State for a variety of reasons. In 2012, when this whole started issue started flaring up, we were in an election cycle in this country. And the present administration was not interested in leading the country into a third war uh, up an, at an election cycle when there was little public stomach for it. Secondly, there is also an understood and implicit understanding from hard-fought lessons or hard-learned lessons from the military perspective. That is the case examples of not only Iraq and the Afghanistan campaigns, but also the campaigns of Vietnam, which basically suggests that since World War II, the US military has not engaged in any military campaign which has ended in a successful and defined outcome. And that's shocking. Uh, and the military strategist's advice to the present administration or subsequent administration, which will have to deal with this, is if you are looking for a credible strategy that will say, this is what it means to have a successful mission outcome that we've eradicated the Islamic State, then we not necessarily have one for you. What is an acceptable mission? What is a successful mission to remove the Islamic State? Does it require American troops alongside partner countries' troops to go in and take out the Islamic State? Do we then stay and help build the country back up, the Assyrian uh, state back up? Does that mean, do we, will we then have a mandate to remove Assad or keep Assad? What will be the perspective of regional countries such as Iran, Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar? who have vested interests and voices in the future of Syria. You see, the longer you, and the more you continue asking these questions, the more it becomes apparent that there is no easy answer. And defining success becomes almost impossible. And I'm not here to necessarily suggest a policy, but I'm just here to sort of point out the intricacies and the complications of this problem. But continued inaction to remove the Islamic State is resulting in uncontrollable and prolific bombing campaigns in major world capitals and cities. So the fight is now no longer contained within Syria itself, but it's being brought to the doorsteps of Western countries, as well as, yes, probably the United States in the future.
intelligence agencies, the military, is not, are not saying to you if it will happen in this country. It's a question of when it will happen in this country. We do not possess the capacity, either here or in mainland Europe, to prevent ad hoc, non-state -viol non violent actors taking matters into their own hands and carrying out continuous bombing campaigns or more terror attacks. And we've been saying this since the days of 9-11. So this will continue to grow. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is why should we be co concerned or curious about the future stability and territorial integrity of Syria as an American state here? Why should we care? Why is it our business? Uh, and some of the criticisms that have been leveled is saying, well, the United States should not be the global policeman. It's not our job. Isn't it the job of the local and provincial countries that neighbor the, or exist in that part of the world? Is it not also, not also the job of institutions such as uh, the European Union, who also have a vested interest in regional security of Syria? And the question is, yes, these are all right. And the argument that I would suggest is this is not a problem that the US has to solve alone or be involved, alone, involved in alone. But it is one which can basically uh, very much concerns our own national security interests. Why? If the Islamic State is left unfettered and unchecked, this continues to grow. Containment only works so far. But two, in the absence of direct intervention in Syria, what you are looking at is possible state collapse. The similar warnings are being issued for states like Iraq, the future territorial and regime stability of Iraq. If these two countries are allowed to basically go unchecked and fall apart in terms of regimes, then you are looking at the possibly the destabilization of the Middle East en masse. Unchecked and uninterrupted by great power play, such as NATO and the United States, this will continue to lead into major regional rivalries by individual member states surrounding those two states that I've just talked about. And foremost amongst those is Turkey. And that's where the regional perspective comes in. Turkey, which has been a NATO country since 1952, is now involved in the fight against the Islamic State as a secondary aim, not a primary aim. And that should give you some concern. And, but Turkey is, no, not, is in no shape or form alone in this. With the exception of the United States, every country surrounding Syria and Iraq seems to be concerned with the Islamic State's future and what it will mean to the territorial security of the region and Syria and Iraq only as a secondary aim. Turkey's vested interest in this part of the world right now is two things. One, to prevent the future formation of a Kurdish state in northern Syria. And two, the absolute unconditional toppling of the Assad regime. Those are Turkey's major goals. Iran's major aim in the region with respect to the Islamic State and uh, Syria is not necessarily the form of uh, the Islamic State. That's great. But what comes afterwards is they would like to see the presence of continued Assad rule or certainly the rule of a Shiite friendly regime that is friendly to Iran. And that's also the same with the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation has not advanced in terms of military and strategic interests into this part of the world or any part of, this, uh, any part of the world since the Cold War to the extent that it has under uh, Vladimir Putin. It is running campaigns in the Ukraine in a land grab operation. And it's also established air bases and placed and positioned uh, Russian troops within Syria itself. That is the most bold Russian military and strategic expansion that we have seen since World War, uh, sorry, the end of the Cold War, with the specific intention under Putin of making the Russian Federation a great country again, a great power again. Unchecked by NATO and its partners, but possibly spearheaded by the United States, what you're looking at is a storm in a teacup, which is already, already brewing right now. The Turks, because there is a lack of an overarching NATO presence or a NATO strategic policy, 
or a policy spearheaded by the US, the major power in the region, the Turks are basically following their own game. And that game is the toppling of the Assad regime and insisting that an Iraq, a, 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 a Kurdish state is not formulated within northern Syria itself. Up until the early 2000s, Turkey and the Syrian state were at loggerheads. They were not allies. They were not even close friends. They almost came to war in 1998. But the Turkish president since about 2007, when he was prime minister, started a campaign of basically what they refer to as zero problems with neighbors and engaging regionally with Middle Eastern states. And that included the Assads. And that continued to proliferate and grow up until the beginning of the Arab uprisings and the Syrian revolution. Assad and Erdogan, the Turkish president, basically fell out very, very quickly, simply because Erdogan, Turkey's president, insisted to the West saying, I have a very credible relationship with Assad that I've built in the last five years. Give me a chance to speak to him, and he will relent. And he will give up, and he will allow the people to have their voice and a transition of power to take place. And the only reason why Erdogan is fervently interested in toppling Assad right now is because it's personal. It's personal because Erdogan was basically lied to or crossed by Bashar al-Assad. Assad said he would listen to Erdogan, promised him that he would allow a regime transition in, in, in Syria, and then continued business of basically cracking down and, uh, and, and, and upscaling the civil war in Syria, which made Erdogan look like an idiot, right? And since then, Erdogan has been hell-bent on wanting to topple Assad. And what we have seen since 2012 is Turkey, a NATO power, basically facilitating or trying to facilitate a regime change, the first in Turkey's political history, and allowing and funding and logistically supporting any and all opposition groups in Syria that have a vested interest in basically toppling the Assad regime. So who are those people? Who are those groups? Uh, these people you should be concerned about. You've probably heard of some of them. Jabhat al-Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra, otherwise known as Al-Qaeda. The Islamic State, whose fighters have basically received hospitalization, logistical support, training, and weapons from Turkey. The Erdogan state has allowed foreign fighters to fly in through Turkey, use Turkey as a conduit to join the Islamic State ranks because that's what the Islamic State requested in return for not bombing Turkey initially. And between 2012 to 2015, Turkey was labeled essentially as a jihadi highway. And those jihadi structures in Turkey have now basically established very, very strong networks, entrenched existence, cells. And although Turkey has clamped down on this in terms of preventing foreign fighters going through Turkey, those networks and cells which came to operate in Turkey are now striking against Turkey. But Turkey basically pursuing its own policy of regime change and wanting to topple Assad is just one country in the region that's doing things their own way because of an absence of great power intervention or presence, mainly spearheaded by the US, but also its partners, NATO and the European Union. We don't have a concerted, we do not have a unified plan or an implementation of a strategy, or nor do we have anything in the future that resembles one as to what will happen. And as long as that continues, Individual and particularistic countries in the region, such as Turkey, will continue to basically go down the road of following their own interests. You may think that Turkey is not pulling its weight as a NATO country. Well, that's fine. I agree with you. I'm the first critic of Erdogan's regime on this, saying that we've allowed you know, the proliferation of jihadists, al-Nusra uh, fighters, ISIS fighters in Turkey, 
We have provided weapons uh, uh, support to them. We've allowed foreign fighters to come into the country. But in the absence, which Erdogan demanded of the Obama regime back in 2012, 2013, saying, let's establish some red lines and parameters for an intervention, then this will continue to grow. And then Turkey's small fish in comparison to individual countries following their own aims. What about the Russian Federation? That's an ex-superpower, but it's just grabbed half of Ukraine. And it's also established two military air bases, permanent ones, and those aren't going anywhere in Syria. They're there to stay. And it's just recently pulled back troops. So the continued existence and proliferation of what is now referred to as nonviolent state actors, such as the Islamic State, is the newest and first sort of hyper organization, cult organization in the region that we do not have any plans to combat effectively. At the end of the Cold War in 1990, the first international conflict that we saw and had no idea how to respond to legally was the Bosnian crisis, the collapse of Yugoslavia. Why? Because the UN Charter, the UN Security Council system, or the international system as we know it, is geared towards pre-Cold War, sorry, uh, pre-end of Cold War framework, whereby if, an, if, a, if, a member, if, if, a, if a particular state is aggressed by an external power, then the international community has a right to intervene in that to prevent and maintain the state system and national sovereignty. Bosnia was the first challenge because it was an intrastate conflict, a civil war. It was an ethnic cleansing went on. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people perished. The next big showcase was Rwanda, very similar, <coughs> intrastate conflict. What we're facing now is now not, no longer individual states, within states cl uh, collapsing within themselves, but you have intrastate, non-state violent actors, which is in the case of Islamic State. So we do not have the tools, the legality and the absolute mechanisms which we need to deal with that. What we do have is institutions such as NATO that have intervened in the past in areas such as Kosovo, they intervened partially in Arab uprisings such as the Libyan extent to fall, help facilitate the fall of the Gaddafi regime, but we have been hesitant to get involved in Syria simply because um, of a variety of factors, whether it's domestic here in the upcoming two presidential elections or based on sort of international uh, norms of what defines a successful outcome. But in the absence of all of this, in the absence of intervention, what we'd unfortunately like to see is continued rise of particularistic interests furthered uh, by domestic actors in Turkey, such as the presidency there, or former great powers such as the Russian Federation, um, basically in tandem with other powers such as Iran, pursuing their own national aims. And if we do have a situation where the future territorial integrity of Syria and Iraq is allowed to collapse, then each of those entities that I've just mentioned in terms of countries, as well as uh, non-state violent actors such as ISIS, being able to proliferate and destabilize the future of the Middle East even further. And that's important simply because, from an, again, another realist paradigm, two-thirds of the world's energy reserves, proven energy reserves, exist in that part of the world. Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully I'll take some questions if you have any, but thank you very much. Yes, sir. Is there a human uh, terrain overlay about how the population is going to react after they're after Desh is pushed out? Will they be? They've been uh, occupied for so long. A lot of the beliefs that Desh have, will they 
kind of rub off onto the surrounding community? That's a very good question. I mean, that's, I mean, so these are all the scenarios of, a, of an after-after scenario. So the first problem, obviously, is what you have is Syria as we know it, and that the internal map of Syria is changing day to day based on whether you know, the Islamic State loses one town or another town or, it or takes over another piece of territory. So it's a very fluid map. And then you've got areas of northern Syria which are very heavily dominated by the Kurdish cantons, right? Which are basically trying to join up and form a very unified structure along Turkey's southern border, right? And then what you mention is also occupied lands by ISIS, you know, the Islamic State. Once they, if, if they are allowed to go or get pushed out or eliminated, exterminated, whatever you want to call it, right? Then what happens? Um, because there are so many unknowns that come out of this. So have the local population bought into the ideas uh, that have been disseminated by the Islamic State? Um, and what I mean by those, they should scare everybody. Um, you see six-year-olds, six-year-olds, with a Kalashnikov in their hands, who were basically trained, in inverted commas, trained by the Islamic State to shoot actively Syrian citizens in the back or in the head simply because they are told as children that's what the Quran has ordered them to do. Now, I don't know much about the Quran. I was born in Turkey. But I do know what a six-year-old is like. Um, a six-year-old will believe anything that they're told. The battle that we are fighting now, what I've just been talking about, this is, that's another point to bring up in this. This is the here and now. We get rid of Islamic State, you, we could probably militarily eradicate that, you know, one way or another eventually. But what you're asking is much more important, which is what comes after that? How do you, what's that term that we used a decade ago, win the hearts and minds of people? How do you then subsequently eradicate from the mind of a six-year-old, which will then be a 12-year-old, um, that it's not okay to shoot people because that's what the Quran apparently told them to do? That's, that's just one side of it, right? Um, it also speaks, your question also speaks to about the future of foreign policy formulation in, in a place like the United States. Do we use foreign policy as a, solely as an instrument of eradicating immediate terrorist threats or national security threats as we see it? Or, as some scholars have suggested, is it more about the case of putting democratization at the forefront of our foreign policy? Because in the longer term, that will have more significant payoff in terms of actually preventing the rise of extremism and radical uh, ideological behavior, such as the Islamic State, in terms of funding schools, infrastructure projects, that will allow individuals in the most impoverished regions of the world, such as northern Syria, uh, to receive an education, to have access to clean water resources, social mobility so they can get an education and hopefully get into jobs. Do we concentrate on that? as opposed to just concentrating on things like, you know, military campaigns, which in the longer term is infinitely more expensive. You know, we spent at the height of the Iraq war, we were spending at this height $15 billion a month. Over 10 years, it cost us $8 trillion, and that's money we don't have. And people are saying, well, that's insane. It's not our business to sort of be in that part of the world. That's fine, I agree. It would probably have, you know, if we'd spent a tenth of that in collaboration with partners such as the, United, the European Union, the United Nations, in actually, you know, permanently endowing and funding infrastructure and education policies, then we have a better chance of preventing probably the rise of future extremism and radical entities such as the Islamic State, because the next inculcation of the Islamic State will be much more extreme. If you thought, you know, 10 years ago, we thought Al-Qaeda was the end all and beginning of all, of all extremism. Islamic State is Al-Qaeda and then some. What's next? Yes, sir. So, I mean, <clears throat> obviously, I think the West has a, a very best interest in the Middle East, right? I mean, Europe is experiencing millions of immigrants that's dramatically shifting demographics in tons of countries, and it's destabilizing a lot of European countries. Uh, we've had terrorist attacks by ISIS um, in Europe. 
the United States has a threat not only economically from the destabilization of the Middle East and not having access to energy resources, but also having potential terrorist attacks here in the United States. A destabilized Middle East is bad for the West, period. No matter how you paint it, it's bad for the West. And one of the differing factors from the Middle East that, that's different than Europe or, Ch or uh, Asia or North America is that there's one large dominant power that kind of maintains order within the region. It doesn't exist in the Middle East and no Western country is willing to you know, play that role. What alternative do we have aside from the United States deploying thousands of ground troops in conjunction with Middle Eastern countries and European countries, deploying soldiers on the ground to defeat ISIS in a land battle, uh, secure the Middle East and rebuild a lot of broken states that stabilize the Middle East. What other alternative do we have than to deploy soldiers? Because to me, it seems like if we don't do that, the consequences of rising energy prices, continuous terrorist attacks, and destabilization of European economies as a result of ISIS is far more devastating than the trillion or so dollars we might spend on stabilizing the Middle East. So what option do we have outside of that? I totally agree. The answer is none. That, that we do not have any other alternative. Uh, that, I agree with you 100%. If we, we, the, unfortunately, the average voter doesn't think like this. And that's, what, that's not a criticism. That's just a reality. If I had children who were in the military here, um, I do not. If someone asks me, you know, a parent was to ask me, you know, why should my child go and give their life for this? It's not an easy question to answer. I fully understand that. And I fully sympathize. And I, and I don't propose that lightly. But the answer, you know, it's, the, it's a longer term answer. And that is, if you were to put it in an analogy, you have two options when you get a flu. You can initially treat the symptoms by, you know, taking medication when you feel the first symptoms. You know, take your Advil, you know, cold and sinus or, you know, Dayquil or whatever. You, take it, you can start to do it then. Or you can wait till the symptoms proliferate and you get a full-blown, you know, uh, uh, chest infection which then turns into requiring antibiotics, which can then transform into pneumonia, et cetera, et cetera, where it becomes the consequences, the cost of treating it becomes much more sort of pay, uh, painful. You experience a lot of pain and discomfort. It's, up, it's, 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 it's that kind of mentality that we're looking at. You, we can even look at it now as a problem that, can, that will have uh, certain options, like you say, which I agree with, and, and a significant operation put together by the United States and its partners. I think when the US takes the decision, the bold decision to, which I think will be on the doorstep of the next president, no question, no question. Um, the next administration will have to confront that. Uh, in, once the US takes a strong position in this, then it's essentially another coalition building pro process with some very long term goals uh, in sight. Um, and I don't know how we go about doing that. Because the experiences of Iraq tell us, no matter how long you strategize or what period of time that you strategize for, after 10 years still, or just after 10 years, the future security of Iraq is no longer assured. Um, you know, pundits, talking heads, analysts, no matter who you call it, it's only when they're all asking, when will Iraq break up again? So how we do it is another question. Whether we do it, I'm fully agreed with you, it has to be done. Um, not doing anything, it just, you know, another analogy is you can spend $1 doing it now or you can spend $10 trying to tackle it later on, you pick, um, if it, if it, on just a financial issue. Um, but that's why until we learn the lessons of what our foreign policy should be, do we just treat the symptoms, which is a problem of extremism, terrorism, non-state violent actors, do we just deal with that when we need to? Or do we deal with, start dealing with the root causes of this? The developed world, such as the European Union, the United States, the developed or developing world has a vested interest for very materialistic and immediate reasons for becoming engaged permanently in the affairs of the most impoverished part of the world because unless we do, what we're seeing with the Islamic State and the Middle East is just what the first of major problems that's likely to crop up in other parts of the world subsequently. In one, at one level, it's a battle between haves and have-nots. 
Um, we've been warned about, you know, scholars keep, have been warning about this for decades. Um, but yes, I do not see another alternative to it. Yes, ma'am. So, with with Turkey's um, perspective on this, Turkey, as I said, was Erdogan's policy initially, after repeated warnings, after um, lambasting by the administration here as well as uh, journalists, etc., saying stop aiding and abetting all foreign fighters and extremist elements in Syria to topple Assad because it's not helping anybody. Erdogan didn't listen. And in return for the facilitation of Islamic State and controlled activities by the Turkish regime, um, what you saw was a, tacit, a possible tacit agreement between Turkey and the Islamic State authorities, to what extent they exist, to basically hold off on Turkey. Now, where that changed is under insurmountable international pressure uh, on certain highline issues. The siege of the town of Kobani uh, by the Islamic State, which is visible across the Turkish border, right? It's like, um, you know, looking at Tijuana across the US border, you can, it's just visible, right? You see, and that town was besieged by uh, Islamic State fighters, and it was a major battle between uh, the Kurds of Kobani and the Islamic State. And it's also on the poster of this presentation um, what the Turkish military did was essentially place tanks, Turkish tanks, on its border and just watched as the town was ravaged by um, the Islamic State. And the Kurdish fighters managed to hold out and under very intense US and international pressure conceded and allowed Kurdish fighters to come in from Iraq through Turkish soil and into Kobani to help their kin out. That resulted basically in the end of the tacit agreement between the Turkish authorities and the Islamic State. Months after that, what we start to see is the first of a series of bombs um, targeted by the Islamic State that went off in Turkey. Uh, there are over six now, six explosions, not all of them Islamic State owned, but at least half of them um, that have gone off in Turkey. So this is a reflection of the cell network and the strategic network of the Islamic State and foreign fighters' presence in Turkey that has become entrenched. So we see random bombs going off in Turkish towns and cities, one in Ankara, you know, sorry, not one in Ankara, several in Ankara, two in Istanbul, uh, one in Suruç, which is a small town in, near the Kurdi. Um, and security experts in Turkey, as well as here, they're saying more are going to go off because these cell structures are not basically um, you know, accountable to anyone financially, strategically, they have their own game. It's a very radical organization. Um, Turkey has a pretty good intelligence system, but right now it's not focused on basically doing the bidding of intelligence work. It's doing the bidding of Erdogan's work. It works for Erdogan. Not, it's, it doesn't maintain its bureaucratic independence. So here, for example, you have the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, the FBI. These institutions have strong sense of you know, bureaucratic integrity. You know, they have certain operational parameters that advise the administration in terms of pass. Seldom there have been reports of it. There's been writing about it. Seldom there are reports of the administration, the political administration, bearing down saying, find us what we need to take on WMDs or whatever. And those are the instances that have come out in recent memory. But in Turkey, what we have is the political administration deeply politicizing the administration of national intelligence, the military responses to it, and basically saying, this is what we require to do. So Turkey right now is what I will call in sort of, um, you know, Alice in Wonderland terminology, we're, in, we're, we're down the rabbit hole. Um, it's not a sensible, sane, and rational government. It's basically at the whims of Erdogan's own will um, in terms of how he would like uh, the country to respond to it. So, um, and Erdogan has profited politically out of these uh, bomb attacks. And, you know, this is where the conspiratorial theory has come into it. Um, 
The number of bombs going off in Turkey is what, what is what allows Erdogan to basically, you know, gain a lot of uh, political support from, from, from a lot of voters. Because he says on TV saying, if you were to make me a strong president, Turkey right now has a parliamentary system. And the president, the office of the president is very much of a ceremonial figure. It's an emeritus position traditionally. But Erdogan, who has assumed the presidency a year and a half ago, is very much interested in basically becoming a very strong president. And he's saying to the people, if you were to make me strong president, we wouldn't have all these bombs going off. And he actually overtly said, if you'd given me those, the, you know, if you'd made, if you'd changed Turkey's constitution, if you'd given me that, we wouldn't have had those bombs. I read that as a threat. Um, were, was the country in a situation whereby these terrorist cells were left unchecked on purpose? Where bombs were allowed to go off unchecked to in, you know, induce mass hysteria and fear amongst the people? such that now people, when they go to the polls in a subsequent election, will favor constitutional changes um, that will allow Erdogan to become a president, strong president. Some, my students at, in Washington, they, they call it as the frank underutilization of Turkish politics. You know, making the obscene palatable in politics to facilitate his regime. But though that's circumstantial and suspect. I don't have any evidence to support that, but it looks pretty looks pretty dire. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, and uh, Russia is feeling a little paranoid about uh, NATO, understandably, because it doesn't want to be encircled by NATO, and that's one of its motives in, in uh, pushing back uh, you might say, in the Ukraine situation and taking over Crimea down there below it. So uh, my question has to do with the fact that uh, uh, the US, uh, that, that Turkey, as you've told us, uh, wants, uh, at least Erdogan wants Basad out. And then we, the US, uh, you know, the, the big mega <laughs> NATO power, we want Basad out. So I'm wondering if Russia wants Assad to continue uh, and is, is pushing and has its military there it, as a way to kind of thumb its nose at NATO? I mean, sure. I mean, um, I mean, let's face it. The Russians have been basically feeling encircled and shoved up by NATO since the end of the Cold War. I mean. Numerous opportunities, well, I mean, you know, with the immediate collapse of the Iron Curtain, you know, an immediate step was taken by NATO alliance basically to include a great number of countries and former Eastern European countries, Soviet bloc countries to be included in NATO, and that's what happened. Um, the Russians have never felt appreciated or approached by NATO or courted by NATO or the West, let's just say, since the end of the Cold War. Is that true? Uh, yes and no. To a greater extent, no. So that sort of mindset of being shoved out by NATO and encirclement by NATO very much has, you know, been in the mindset of, um, you know, Russia's governors since 1990. That's never changed. Um, similarly, with the inclusion of, you know, the former Eastern European countries in the European Union now since 2004, 2007. Um, that mentality has never been shoved away and, and, you know, forgotten about. It's just become more intense. Um, you know, with, with Vladimir Putin, the, uh, he possesses very similar traits in terms of what he would like to do and how he goes about doing, uh, strategizing and implementing policy in the ways that Erdogan does. You know, the Russian economy is straining. It's, it's not doing well. I mean, it's, it's, it's on the ropes. Um, but unlike Turkey, Russia is in a very strategic position to throw its military weight about in the region. Uh, that's not something that Turkey can do to the same impact and effect of Turkey. If Russia wants to move in on the Ukraine in the way that it is done, Putin guessed it right. The United States will not do anything. Not because it cannot, it just won't. It, what is it gonna do? What are we gonna do, send in battle carriers and have a face off? I mean, uh, does NATO take a strong stand against it? Guessing and calculating wisely 
that nothing was going to be done by the NATO allowance allowed Putin very, very quickly and effectively to annex Crimea, uh, move his sphere of influence into, into the Ukraine in a way that he cannot do with Eastern Europe. Ukraine is up for grabs. It always has been uh, by, on, on the part of Russians. In terms of his, Putin's Syria policy, again, that's very, very dangerous. Erdogan, you know, Turkey and the Russian Federation for the first time now is at very, very uh, opposite sides of the fence. We've come to war closely, very close. Uh, in November, if you remember, was it November? I think it was November last year. November or December, I can't remember, just gone. Uh, I don't know, I guess it didn't play, yes, it did play out here quite a, you know, in the news cycle. Turkey shot down a Russian fighter jet over Turkish soil, militarily struck a fighter jet. Um, if Russia were to respond it, it were to have responded at that time and shoot down a, Rush, a Turkish jet, or worse, if the Russian soldiers or Russian military incurred on Turkish territory, that would have compelled NATO into a war. This is where it becomes really, really dangerous. Um, and that goes back to what I was saying about you know, a concerted strategy and well-formulated strategy on part of the United States its partners, including possibly Russia, in the future of what happens in Syria. Because if we don't, the Russians are interested in basically establishing or continuing an Assad-friendly regime in, or a Shiite-friendly regime that's sympathetic to Russians. Uh, the Russian forces are also shelling and primarily hitting not Islamic State targets, but rebel targets which are supported, some of which are supported by the Turks. But Turkey is not, is not a country that can go military, militarily toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians. We, we're, we're NATO, sure. You know, we have, a, we have more game against the Syrians directly or, or the Iraqis or any other power in the region, save for the Israelis. Um, but we can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians. Um, and Erdogan knows this. Uh, but shooting down a, a, a Russian jet was a very, very bold gesture, a folly. You know, I'm not saying I'm not praising it, but it sends a very strong signal to the Russians saying, you know, you're, you're moving stuff around here in terms of moving on in Ukraine or basically establishing yourself in the, Russian, in the Syrian state and having your game there. Fine. But I'm also signaling that I'm not shy, shying away from provoking an attack by you on my soil, which will, which will implicate NATO powers. This is the kind of uh, power play, saber rattling and power play that's going on in the region right now. Um, and it's very, very dangerous and fluid and fragile. Yes, ma'am. What will there be one from the US, from oh, that's Europe, a great question. from NATO? That's a great question. In order to stop back in nice alignment. Uh, well, they've stopped doing that. But pursuing the Islamic State as a primary aim, okay. Turkey just has a lot of wants. We don't want the Iranians what, practicing what they call sectarian politics in Syria. We don't want Russians having a foothold in Syria and facilitating and propping up a Shiite-friendly regime, whether it's Assad or anyone else. At this point, they don't really care. But the Turks don't want that. Um, we also want Assad gone, period. But the Americans are looking at this and saying, look, there are two major problems here. The major problems are a post-Assad Syria. We're asking a legitimate question in this country. Are we safer off globally, regionally, internationally, whatever, in a Syrian situation where a regime or the Assad regime continues for a while? If so, what will that look like? Or are we better off without him completely? Who's going to manage the country? Who's going to rule it? Um, that's a legitimate question. And the other question that we're, saying, uh, that we're asking is, what will it take to defeat ISIS? Um, and those are questions that Turks aren't necessarily an answering. So what it will take for the Turks to com comply right now is the American, uh, Turkish assur American assurance to the Turks saying, one, we want Assad gone, which is not going to happen. It's not a blanket policy that the US is pursuing. And the Turks can be brought round to that. They'll have to. 
Two, what we're going to, the Turks will really require in terms of assurance is one that we've, the Turks have been asking and getting for a long, long time, which is not, the guaranteed assurances that a Kurdish state will not be formed in northern Syria along Turkey's border. Turks have basically won, that, won and asked and gotten that since the first Gulf War. The entire reason why the no-fly zone was established by Clinton in northern Iraq after Saddam or before Saddam fell was to basically placate the Turks and contain Kurds in northern, in northern Iraq. So those are, that, that, that's what it will take. And there's certain elements that Turkey can be uh, sort of persuaded and brought round to, and there's certain things that they won't be brought round to. Unfortunately, Turkey is a country, you know, it's, not a, it's a medium-sized power, it's a NATO country, whatever. It's always been a country that, and, and it will always likely to be a country, that can punch above its weight. And that's solely based on its geostrategic position. Um, it's been able to get that since uh, 19, the 1950s. Um, and that's just power play. Uh, I, I don't criticize that. I just think that's a reality. That's what we have to work with. Um, but in terms of how you know, we find, how we coordinate with other countries in terms of defeating the Islamic State, decisiveness has to start here, which can then basically be uh, sp uh, disseminated through uh, partners such as NATO, as well as allies such as uh, con in, uh, countries within NATO and, and beyond, even the Russians, uh, who can be brought into this possibly. But until that happens, unfortunately, we're just going to see um, a lot more of a mess, I think. Uh, yes, ma'am. Turks. What's the genesis of it? Sure. Um, so the, the Kurds, what you can term the Kurds as, is the largest stateless nation in the world, in that, certainly in that part of the world, right? The territorial ambitions span uh, southeastern Turkey, northern Iraq, northern Syria, parts of Iran, historically, under the Ottoman Empire. It was a province of Kurdistan for a great long amount of time. In the 1980s, uh, beginning of the 1980s, uh, separatists in Turkey's, uh, separatist uh, Kurds in Turkey's southeastern provinces began a secessionist movement uh, under the umbrella of an organization referred to as the PKK, which carried out terrorist attacks um, in a similar vein to the IRA in Northern Ireland, um, ETA in, in Spain, um, to basically carve out territory um, from, from Turkey. And that has resulted in uh, numerous casualties in Turkey on both the state uh, as well as uh, Kurdish sides. Probably about 50 to 60,000 lives lost, in, and it cost trillions of dollars uh, of money. Anyway, so that's the Turkish component of it. Erdogan in Turkey began a peace process uh, in 2010, 2011, and then a more recent one in 2013, both of which have failed. And that's resulted in the PKK and its more radical splinter groups um, there's one referred to as TAK, which carried out one of the um, terrorist bombings in Istanbul recently, um, or in Ankara, I believe. I can't remember which now. Um, but essentially, the moment that Erdogan ended the peace process, right, the Kurdish uh, separatist movement has flared up again. So what you're seeing now is, in Turkey's southeastern provinces, conditions of, um, of, of, of basically civil war. The Turkish military has basically clamped down on numerous provinces. Um, they basically close off a town. No one goes in or out except the military and law enforcement. They shut down telephone, internet. They impose a round-the-clock curfew, and there's no time limit set. So people are basically locked indoors, and then tanks proceed to go in, tanks. And they basically reduce these towns down to rubble, right? It looks like downtown Damascus. No kidding. Um, and the idea is under the, under, under the name of fighting terrorism, because they say there's terrorist elements um, within these towns, and there are. There's no doubt about it. In, 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 in addition to pursuing terrorists, what they also seem to be doing, the, the military has been told by Erdogan, is basically to punish Kurds. Um, so you, you're, you're seeing civilians killed. And when you talk, you're talking about women, children, elderly, getting summarily executed and um, killed by sniper fire. Um, it plays out in the it's, it, it's horrific. But unfortunately, that feeds into Erdogan's uh, political campaign. Um, the, the more he clamps down, the more terrorist attacks by extremist Kurds get carried out. Mainstream public opinion in Turkey then turns against Kurds and the peace processes. 
and Erdogan is likely to get more votes. Democracy dies a slow death, essentially. Yes? Um, to what extent do you think Israel's presence played a role in our decision to not take action as a country? And um, to what extent do you think it plays a role now with Russia as a factor? I mean, again, it, you know, with, with Israel and Turkey for a while, for a long time, have this basically big picture, same security concerns for the entire region. Eye to eye, the, Russian, uh, the Turks and the Israelis see eye to eye in everything. What we don't see eye to eye in is Erdogan and Netanyahu. Um, Erdogan does not get on or does not have any affinity to getting on with, with the Israelis for a long, long time, since 2010, where Turkish-Israeli relations just collapsed. Um, but whether it's you know, the future territorial security of Syria or the territorial integrity of, uh, of Iraq or the containment of the Iranian regime, Turks and Israelis, big picture, on all these issues, we share the same policies. What we don't share is the two knuckle-headed visions of uh, the, president's, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of Turkey. And in both cases, well, more in the case of Turkey, Turkey's decision-making in terms of, you know, taking a, a positive approach into coordinating policies is sidelined. The policies which should be made and advised by Turkey's foreign ministry and Turkey's military are not being listened to by, the, by, by Erdogan. Erdogan wakes up literally, just literally, and determines what his policy will be, and then the institutions and agencies implement that. I have to, because they're afraid of him. Um, and the reason as a result of that, why Israel, Turkey, cannot, and this is pushed by the United States. The US is pushing very, very hard for Israel and Turkey to mend fences very, very quickly. And that's actually something that might come out in a very, very new future. Erdogan was in Washington last week, and basically there seems to be a lot of fence mending going on behind the scenes because Turkey has no friends left in the region. Um, and Israel has been making very, very sort of bold gestures to get Erdogan back on side because security interests for both Israel and Turkey are very, very much on the same page. We want a moderate Sunni regime in Syria. We want somehow for the political containment of Iran, one way or another. We're also in favor of the, of the territorial security and integrity of uh, Iraq. And we also, big picture, would like to combat the Islamic State. But until those fences are mended, we're not getting anywhere. I know that, well, I mean, I research, but I know that um, Russia had made affairs with Turkmenistan, and they put their tanks on the border close to Turkey. So that was kind of a threat. And I also remember reading something about a German ship being bombed. I, I don't know about that one. But there, there's been a lot of bombing, so. Yeah, I mean. So with, with respect to, um, you know, antagonism between the Russian, you know, you know shooting down a Russian jet is, is, is not something that's done lightly. Um, and people are sort of asking the question of under what conditions was that done? You know, the, the Russian fighter, if you listen to the audio tapes, it's in English, um, the Turkish border, you know, traffic air, contro air traffic controller repeatedly warns the Russian fighter saying, you are approaching Turkish airspace, you know, veer off, just, you know, pull out. Um, and this goes on for about 75 seconds um, prior to the jet crossing into Turkish airspace. As soon as, it's crossed in, as, as, soon as it crosses in, it's shot down uh, by a Turkish fighter, um, which means they were ready, which means the rules of engagement had already been cleared with the Turkish uh, authorities. And the pilot already had standing orders to shoot this thing down. Um, was, it a, you know, was it sensible? Was it you know, an immediate threat? I mean, my problem with it is, yeah, sure, it's rules of engagement. It's, it's legitimate. It's legitimate. You know, by military rules of engagement, it's legitimate. You can shoot down a jet, which cross, a fighter jet that crosses into your territory. 
The problem is you have to weigh the political implications of this, and not the, fight, not the pilot, but the person issuing those orders, the rules of engagement. Um, the reason is, for example, Turkey and Greece, which have had disputed airspace for 40 years, if not more, right? Routinely, Greek and Turkish fighter jets cross into disputed air t territories. And we have Turkish jets following Greek jets and Greek fighter jets following Turkish jets. But in 30 years, we've come pretty close, but we've never shot each other down. I'm not saying it's a healthy relationship, but we've known none of us have ever shot each other down. What, what was it that allowed Erdogan just to say, take this guy down? or issue orders that any further Russian jets in current, and that wasn't the first instance. You know, Russian jets had been flagrantly ab uh, abusing Turkish airspace because it's a shorter route through Turkey. Um, but Erdogan wanted to send a message saying, we are not going to allow, you know, Russian diplomatic pressure to have a, you know, move on in Syria because we might want to try and pull a NATO to prevent that if necessary. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.